Uh, let me present uh, Jerome, Jerome Pacenti. Uh, so Jerome uh, founded uh, Vivissimo, uh, a, a search engine company based out of Pittsburgh uh, about, a, was it about 12 years ago? 14, yeah. 14 years ago, wow, okay, for, uh, about 14 years ago. Uh, recently acquired by IBM's uh, big, data, uh, big data practice, uh, and then recently, I guess, reacquired by the Watson uh, group within IBM. Uh, Jerome's role has kind of shifted from a you know, CEO to a, uh, Chief Scientist and now into the VP of uh, Watson Core Technology, uh, where he's leading a group of uh, research and developers in uh, taking the technology that was used to uh, beat Ken Jennings uh, at Jeopardy and that other guy who nobody remembers uh, in Jeopardy uh, and uh, making it something that uh, is repeatable and actually, um, actually usable. Uh, so, Jerome. Thank you. All the things. So I thought it made it make it, you know, maybe a little more entertaining. Uh, maybe less. I don't know if it's going to use, you know, you're going to use this tomorrow for a job, but I think it'll give you a little bit of a glimpse uh, of a potential future out there, what's coming, and uh, how it's going to be different. So I want to talk about uh, cognitive computing, uh, which is, as uh, Michael mentioned, related to uh, Watson. IBM believes that there is a new era starting around cognitive computing is going to change a lot of things. And I want to tell you what it's about, what you should care, uh, what you should pay attention, and uh, the kind of problem it brings. Actually, I'll show you the problems I have on, on a day-to-day -day basis developing software uh, uh, that's trying to be cognitive. So to start with, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, I uh, started a company 15 years ago. I sold it a couple of years ago. And by now, I thought I'd be on a beach uh, and relaxing. Actually, especially my wife. She thought we would be there. Uh, but something happened. And that something Andrew, is this. You're just a little stiff. You don't have this painful mosquito-borne joint illness with a Swahili name. Watson? What is Deng fever? Dengue fever, correct. Atchud brute for 1,200. Paganini's 24 Capricci set the standard for etudes for this instrument. Watson. What is violin? Good. 2000, same category. From 1911 to 1917, this romantic Russian composed etude tableau for piano. Watson. Who is Rachmaninoff? Rachmaninoff is correct, and that adds to your lead. You're at 13,400. Go again. Don't worry about it. For 1200. You just need a little more sun. You don't have this hereditary lack of pigment. Watson. What is albinism? Good. Cambridge for 1600. Answer, <laughs> daily double. What are you going to wager? I'll wager $6,435. <laughs> I won't ask. I won't ask. Here's the clue for you, Watson. The chapels at Pembroke and Emmanuel Colleges were designed by this architect. Who is Sir Christopher Wren? You are right. And that so for those who are uh, maybe not familiar with this, especially people who are not in the US, this was uh, part of a grand challenge that IBM started in 2007. So IBM has this idea of creating grand challenges. You know, one, another one was Deep Blue around beating the world champion in chess. And in 2007, they wanted to do a grand challenge for their 100 years anniversary of IBM. And they decided, OK, can we beat the best player at Jeopardy? And they went on this quest. They actually didn't know if they could do it or not. And in 2011, they went with that uh, uh, software program on live TV during a show. Uh, and they demonstrated they could actually do it. And they won the show, won a million dollars for a charity, and the rest is history. Now, in 2014, uh, just this January, uh, IBM decided to create the Watson Group. And they decided to take uh, the, the technology behind Watson, which they had started to, uh, to commercialize, and other very interesting technology that they call cognitive around speech, around natural language, around machine translation, and put that all into one group around the Watson brand and try to kind of start uh, you know, a new era and get people to build what they call cognitive application. My role, uh, and that's why I'm not on the beach today, and that's why this is what I look at every day instead of the, uh, instead of the beach, is to uh, develop the, what they call the Watson platform. Put some cognitive services in the cloud on a platform that anybody uh, can use. And hopefully many of you here uh, will start using uh, in the next year or two. Um, so that's, the, that's my role right now. 
So what I want to do is tell you a little bit about you know, what's, what does that mean, cognitive computing? And to start with, is that it's really a, a class of problems. It's a different type of problems that you usually will associate with humans. And it's a type of cognitive problem. It involves perception, intuition, reasoning, learning, and that you would expect only humans can solve, like you know, being the best at Jeopardy. Uh, now, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of things uh, that we do. So one a natural uh, uh, extension to what was done in Jeopardy is you know, everything around Q&A, trying to answer questions. So uh, IBM now is trying to take Jeopardy, uh, the, 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 the software that uh, was very good at Jeopardy and apply it to other domains okay, and try to have commercial application. And I'll show you uh, a few examples. And on doing that, you know, the first thing you try to do is you know, try to sometimes replace humans. Um, and one good example is around customer service and customer support. So imagine when you, you know, instead of calling uh, you know, customer support for your favorite phone company, uh, waiting for half an hour and then uh, uh, getting to someone uh, that at best can tell you that you didn't read the documentation properly, or at worst uh, doesn't, hasn't read the documentation themselves uh, and can tell you the answer, uh, you could actually have a computer that automatically goes around, collect all the documentation of all the products, all the problem reports, and basically when you ask a question, try to answer that by analyzing that information and give you the answer out there. Now, it's not ex exactly replacing humans because at the end, uh, the technology today cannot obviously replace any kind of answer uh, possible, very often because the answer is not in the documentation. But it's really about filtering the initial call. So instead of calling, you go on a site, you start asking questions there, and in a good percentage of the cases, the system can give you a good answer and you don't have to call anybody. That's the, that's the idea. Now, what we found is when, uh, we, uh, when IBM uh, did that challenge, went on TV, uh, the most people who called us came from the medical industry. A lot of doctors told us, hey, we could really use uh, Watson to help us deal with all this growing set of uh, documentation of a publication. You know, doctors have a hard time keeping up with all the new publication out there and they wanted to have a tool that can help them sift through that to help them diagnose and prescribe uh, treatments. And this is what IBM came up with. Dr. Mark Norton, a clinical oncologist, is preparing to see a patient. He logs into the electronic medical record and instead of spending time trying to find relevant information, he uses the IBM Watson Oncology Diagnosis and Treatment Advisor he pushes the Ask Watson button and Watson analyzes the patient data against tens of thousands of documents from its vast body of medical literature. Dr. Norton starts with the case information tab where Watson has pulled out the relevant information as well as suggestions for additional information to gather. Moving to the test options tab, he sees tests that Watson suggests that he consider ordering. He presses the evidence button to see the reasons why Watson suggested the first test. Then he drills down further into a specific reference that supports the suggestion. Once the results of the tests come in, Dr. Norton presses the Treatment Options tab to see a panel of suggested confidence scored treatments. He also sees a list of clinical trials to consider. Again, he reviews the supporting documentation by pushing the Evidence button. Dr. Norton has new information to add to the case, so he pushes the blue Watson avatar on the bottom and speaks directly into the microphone. He makes sure that his words have been transcribed correctly and submits the new information. Watson returns a revised set of confidence scored treatment suggestions that take the new information into account. It also updates the list of clinical trials to consider. Shifting gears from Dr. Gordon's role to that of a hospital or health plan administrator, the advisor provides a customizable dashboard showing key performance indicators like where the advisor is being used, how it's performing, and what information sources are most useful. The administrator can drill down into the data more specifically to get more details, such as performance over different time spans, metrics on specific types of cancer, or in this case, a narrower geographic area. This is just one of the many areas that Watson's cognitive capabilities can be applied to help people live and work in better ways. Now other ways that Watson can be used in this kind of technology is counterintuitive, but it's actually in places like Africa. Uh, IBM made a big commitment to invest $100 million for Watson in Africa, and the reason is, it's kind of the same reason why 
uh, cell phones are very, uh, uh, very popular in Africa because there's no infrastructure. So it's easy to come up with something that's better than no infrastructure. In this case, you can come up with automatic diagnostics that are not as good as doctors, but are better than no doctor. And so one of the big push is really for this technology is not to just replace human, which sounds a little bit ominous, but really help people in many different places and many different situations. Now, to do that, there is a set of technologies under that uh, that are pretty advanced. You, know, you can call it AI or AGI, you know, artificial generated intelligence or machine learning. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a, little bit of a history, in, maybe in the, a little bit of the lens of IBM there, of to what these technologies are and how they work. IBM actually, uh, early on, uh, uh, um, injected in the field the notion of statistical machine learning. The idea of using a bunch of data, instead of understanding too much of the data, just injecting the data and from that really getting better results. And there's a good uh, story to illustrate that. So the, the famous researcher, uh, Fred Jelinek, in the speech recognition space, which really launched the space of statistical uh, machine learning. And I, I, I kind of like this story. You can read it, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it. So basically, you know, he wanted to uh, uh, you know, make progress in speech recognition, which is you, know, you take some audio and you transcribe it into text. And at the time, uh, Noam Chomsky had a great influence on the field of linguistic and then that field. And Noam Chomsky's you know, great discovery was that there is uh, something called universal grammar that we are all born on. We all understand that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's in the brain at, at your birth. And the idea that every linguist and every engineer was to follow to do this kind of special recognition was to understand the language first, you know, transcribe it, describe it as a, as a you know, as part three of, of understanding grammar. But what he found out, you know, one day, one, so he, he put a, a team of linguists and engineers together to try to cr crack the problem. But one day, one of his linguists actually quit. And he didn't have another linguist, so he just replaced it with an engineer. And then a few days later, he realized that his performance of this tool actually improved. So he said, huh, that's kind of interesting. So he kind of went to talk to another linguist and say, hey, how about you go find a job at another place there? Uh, and then he replaced it by another engineer. And he found the performance increasing even more. And then he ended up firing all his linguists and just hiring engineers, and that's how the whole field started up. I don't know if the story is true, um, but it illustrates something that actually, to do good speech recognition, especially at the time, it was actually better to throw a lot of data at it, created some probabilistic model and statistical model, versus trying to understand too much of the language in a, comp in a conceptual way. There's actually a great way to illustrate that through another uh, technology, again, that was spearheaded at, uh, at IBM, around machine translation. The real traditional way to do machine translation was to really parse the language, try to understand the grammar, is it a subject, is it a, an object, is it a noun, and then try to transfer that into the other language. And researcher from IBM, actually the same uh, Fred Jelinek and his team actually, came up with another technique which is just to look at pairs of words in sample tra uh, translation, like in the Rosetta Stone. So you input a lot of parallel data of translation, and then you create a probabilistic model as to what word is the most likely to be the translation of this other one by looking at bigrams or trigrams. And that worked tremendously better than what was before. And these techniques that are probabilistic are used every day now in all the tools you use to do translation or speech recognition. Now, when you put the two together, you start getting things that are pretty, pretty interesting, and I'll let you look at that. Where is the nearest pharmacy from here? <laughs> In this video, we demonstrate the advanced capabilities of the IBM speech-to-speech -speech translation system for handheld devices. By providing two-way freestyle speech input, users can speak freely without having to remember or learn predefined scripts. Walk to the corner of the street and turn right, you'll see. I would like to reserve a flight from New York to Beijing tonight at 8.20. Would you like to book a one-way or a round-trip ticket? A round-trip ticket returning on the 23rd of August. The entire system is installed and operates on the handheld device. There is no need for a remote server or a wireless... So... Actually, one of the hardest technology these days is called deep learning. Who has heard of deep learning before? Okay, so what deep learning is, is to use uh, a model of deep neural network 
uh, to process information and learn from it. It's called reinforcement learning. You know, as you process the information, the links between uh, the neurons and so in the nodes there uh, get reinforced, and the system will learn uh, certain things. What's amazing about deep learning is that it seems to extract features. So I don't know if many of you have some experience with machine learning. When I started 15 years ago, I mean, my uh, feeling, I, and I wrote some algorithm there, is that what really matters in a, in a machine learning algorithm are the features. You know, your output will be as good as the features you put in. You know, what do you extract first? You feed into the, the learning uh, mechanism. Deep learning seems to put that into question. What's amazing when you look at these neural networks is that as the information flows through the different layers, features are actually emerging uh, on their own. So the system will figure out if you feel pixels, it will start figuring lines, it will start figuring faces, it will start figuring animals, and being able to classify that. Very, very hot right now. Uh, you know, everybody thinks that, that could be really the next breakthrough. Now, it's a bit of a buzz. So if you ask people, some people think it's a buzz, some people think it's, it's the latest thing. Um, Google just recently made an acquisition of a company called DeepMind. I don't know if you heard the, the most expensive acqui hire uh, in, in the industry. I think 500 million for 100 people without a product. But these people are pretty amazing. This guy is uh, Demis Ashabi, and his view, which is very interesting, is that to understand what algorithms to develop, we should actually study and review neuroscience literature. The idea is to look at what, how the uh, neural network are. Uh, created in the brain, how they function, and try to replicate that, not necessarily as you know, hardware, but as software in the, uh, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the software. And so basically uh, inspire yourself from uh, the neural system. Actually, IBM is even going one way further. They actually develop a system called Synapse, where the computer is actually really a synaptic system that's not a, a regular uh, uh, Turing machine. And so it does do computation in parallel like the brain does. But that's even more further ahead. Now, so some people think it's, 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 a, it's a buzzword, but there are pretty amazing results that have been done recently. So in the last three months, uh, many companies have made an announcement. So Facebook uh, just made an announcement around DeepFace. They are able to create a system when you feed a lot of faces information that's able to recognize faces better than a human with a 97.25% uh, accuracy, better than a human. It's not going to help you know, uh, national security yet, because they do feed a lot of data uh, to it, but it's pretty remarkable. Google, just a, a couple of months after, came up with something that can break their own technology, actually technology invented at, at, in Pittsburgh uh, um, and at CMU, which is the, the CAPTCHA uh, uh, technology. They are able now to create a system that uses deep learning that can break the CAPTCHA better than humans, because I can tell you I can't do 99.8. Uh, this is a stupid CAPTCHA there. Um, IBM actually came up with something very interesting. What, what's, what's interesting with neural network is that you can, fit, you can feed a lot of raw data. You, know, you can feed the audio, you can feed the video. And what IBM researchers have found is that when you feed the video of the lips, the system can actually read lips. Actually, you don't know that, but you actually do it. When there's a very noisy environment out there, uh, your brain actually interprets the lips. There's a huge increase in, in uh, decrease actually in error rates of human recognition. Uh, when you, have, you can read the lips in a noise environment. What they managed to do is to get the same level of improvement that computers do by feeding the, uh, the, uh, the video in the system. So all these things are pretty remarkable. The guy I showed you before, the, the CEO of DeepMind, he, he, has, he likes to, to quote uh, Feynman there, which says, you know, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. Uh, and that's why he's really so much into trying to rebuild this neural network through computers. And I added my own quote there, which uh, we'll transition back to my prime. And the problem with this neural network is that we don't really know how they work, actually. And what's amazing is that we're starting to build systems that we can't really understand. I mean, I tell you, the math and the behavior is starting to become very, very complex. And my suspicion is that as we create these networks that are larger and larger, we throw computing power to it, we'll have less and, uh, less, and less understanding of them, which creates some interesting uh, methodological problem. So, now, what I'd like to do is to show you, you know, when you deal with these technologies and these problems, there are some methodological problems that really uh, uh, arise. And I want to show you a little bit, give you some uh, view as to what the Watson team did, you know, that before I was there, you know, when they tried to do the Jeopardy challenge. So really their challenge was well illustrated by this graph, okay? So you have a certain number of questions that you have to answer at Jeopardy, okay? 
And the cloud above is the performance human. You know, how often do they answer and how accurate they are. And the red dots are the kind of the, are the grand champion, you know, the Ken Jennings of the world, where they were able to do, which is pretty remarkably high. You can see in some games, these are games, there are games where some of the champions answer 100% of the question correct, but they didn't answer all of them, you know, 70, 68% uh, of them. And the state of the art in 2007 was pretty darn low. You can see at the bottom there. It's very, very far from what could be done if you would just feed, feed it to a Q&A system. So that's the challenge it took, to go from this line at the bottom to try to beat the people with the red dust there. Okay. Now what they figure out very quickly is that they will have to do it in a messy way. And that's what's really interesting about these problems. Okay, one non-messy way to do that would have been, okay, let's create one big knowledge model, you know, what is a semantic web, if you want to call it. You know, put all the nodes with all the knowledge in the world in one world structure and have a very neat way to query that. What they found very quickly is that that wouldn't work. It wouldn't be flexible enough, it wouldn't cover enough, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. They needed some kind of messy system. And the messy system is in two ways. On one hand, it's messy because of the data. So instead of trying to take their data and structure it all in one place, they just keep, kept the data sources as is. You know, they took Wikipedia, they processed part of it, they took IMDB, they took all these different, the fact, fact they took all these different sources there, put them out there, and just make them deeply actually kind of searchable and processable, okay? But they didn't try to normalize all that stuff. On the flip side also, there's, they realize there's no silver bullet algorithm. It's not going to be one algorithm that's going to give them the answer to do this. So what they found is the way to do this is to combine a lot and a lot and a lot of different heuristics and then combine them as evidences for an answer. Now that creates a system, you know, that's the system they came up with, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail. They kind of combine a lot of different aspects, you know, information retrieval. At the end, there's kind of search in there. You always kind of search for evidences, natural language parsing, you part the language, try to understand a little bit of the grammar, do some machine learning, some knowledge uh, representation, and some deep analysis, and do this whole distributed architecture. And what they gained, uh, got is a system that little by little improved. They added new things, new algorithms, new heuristics, and uh, new data, and they, got, uh, they got it to improve little by little by little. Now what's remarkable here, if you look at the, date, the dates, you will see that the improvements become uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, diminishing return. That's completely normal. It's always a system. But actually, the, the next 1% you get there is very, very important. And it basically will represent winning or losing against Ken Jennings. Actually, when they went on TV uh, that day, that morning, I think they calculated that they had a 75% chance of winning. So it was not a 100% uh, thing. Because they were above there, but they were not in every case uh, better. Now the problem is to design now an architecture and system where you can do these improvements. Okay, so they came up with kind of this methodology for rapid innovation. Okay, some of these things will sound familiar, but actually there's things that actually are quite different from a standard software engineering problem. So you know, the first thing is they, 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 they establish some kind of prioritization. Here you have to think it's a bit. It's not prioritization of features. It's prioritization of kind of experiments. What are the things we could try? So they look at the literature and say, okay, these people are doing this, these people are doing that. And they kind of came up with a big list. Obviously, they would constantly improve, uh, increase it and evaluate before implementing it, you know, what it will cost to implement it, what would be the cost from a computing standpoint, and what would be the eventual benefits before the experimentation. So they had this kind of big list that they constantly kind of reordered uh, of things they could try, okay? Then what they found is because and that's the, the problem after, is that these things are never done in a vacuum. It was very good to put everybody in one room. So they created one big lab, it's still there actually in, in, in IBM Watson, one big room where most of the people work in Watson where and live there day in and day out, okay? Because they found that it was very important someone could ask the other expert, you know, if their stuff would affect their own algorithm. Now the real crux of the problem is this idea of experimentation, okay? As they are trying these new things, these new algorithms, they need to try and experiment them. But it's actually kind of hard to experiment. Ideally, you will look at an experiment as a small improvement that you can unit test separately of the rest. That would be the ideal system, so that you can have a big team building separate components that keep building, and they test their own thing in isolation with others. And the problem there is that it doesn't work. You can't test a small piece in isolation of the rest. You can also cannot test uh, a small piece with a mock. You have to actually test it with real data. The thing that's even nastier with this is that the more you test, the more you make your blind test 
uh, 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 irrelevant. So the more you test, actually, the more you find out about your blind test. So the idea of all these tests is that you have to have a blind test so you know your performance on data you have never seen. But the problem is when you test on that data, you start seeing it. And it creates this really nasty problem that you cannot test too much or else you learn from the, the, the blind set. And blind sets are very expensive. So you have a system where you actually have a limited capability of testing. The other thing is you don't know what isolation really means. Unfortunately, you could try to develop it in isolation, but you may put an algorithm that af after when it will be combined with another algorithm, when the machine learning kicks in and look at which one is more important, could really disrupt something else. And unfortunately, it's not a linear thing like this. It could be that after add adding 10 different algorithms, the first one you added now become negative. And so what they had to do, for example, was to start adding and removing, and they will do actually ablation after the fact. Every once in a while, they will start removing some of the algorithms and seeing if it will actually improve or, uh, or, uh, or uh, hurt the, the, uh, uh, the accuracy of the system. And then the problem also is you don't necessarily know when you have bugs, because when you implement something, did you implement the algorithm wrong? Or did you actually, the algorithm doesn't work? How are you going to find that out? Because the behavior is not very, especially when you do this kind of learning, when there's this fuzzy outputs, um, you don't necessarily know what exactly the, uh, the output should be. It's very hard to test. And the last thing that's kind of tough is that, while well, it's a, a bit of a research framework here, so you do actually a lot of experiments, you throw them all at it, and you're going to reject a lot of them. So you actually do a lot of work that at the end will lead to nothing. So that's a problem. But they managed to put kind of infrastructure, I'm not going to go too much in the detail there, that allow them to do that. So they will do this kind of regression every two weeks. Uh, so they couldn't do, obviously, continuous delivery in this case. But you know, at least they could do it in two weeks, where they would test everything. And then the ideas that would improve, they would keep them. The ideas that would not improve, they would go back uh, for, for trying again. There was also a team trying to improve the test sets. But obviously, you don't, can't change the test set too much. Uh, there was a team trying to improve the knowledge. There was a team looking at the errors and trying to, uh, to analyze them. So they, they managed to create a system that you know, got them to where they wanted. Now, my problem now is that I inherited this, and I need to commercialize it. And the problem is that when you try to commercialize this, now you get a whole new set of problems that's even more complicated. Well, the first thing is collaboration. Well, you think at IBM I can put all the team in one place? No. We have world teams now. So the people are all over the place, and they still need to collaborate. And they still have this problem that if they do something, it can impact other people. Now, when you commercialize it, you're not looking at one use case just for Jeopardy. You're looking at lots of use cases in different domains, in medical versus finance. And how do you prioritize it? And even a little more nasty than prioritization, the problem is you may do things in one domain that are going to hurt the other domain. And how do you test for this? When you have 25 different domains that maybe other people are trying to deploy on, how are you going to test that it's going to affect them or not? So that creates a lot of, uh, of problems. So first is that you have all these domains, and they all have this version of the truth. Okay? Now, other, the other problem is that very often in the case of Jeopardy, what happens is they had a set of questions. And you know, they told me they couldn't have done it without that from the past. So they had all these questions, you know, these 10,000 questions they could test from the past. Now, we go to a customer, let's say for a customer support application. We don't, they don't have the, necessarily the question that people ask and the right answer for this question. It, it doesn't exist. People don't have this kind of question and answer sets. So we don't have that ground truth that we can start testing on. Very, very tricky problem. And then in some domains, actually, some questions don't have answers. Maybe they don't have answers because there's no content that has an answer. But also sometimes they don't have answers because even the experts can't agree what the answer is, uh, which makes the problem very tricky. I mentioned that before. Because we have these tests of when you add something that are very expensive because you need to kind of test it on the data, it's very hard to do any kind of continuous delivery or continuous integration. So it, there's a problem there. And then how do you tell, you know, how do I tell my boss that we're going to do, you know, 80% of investigation and we're going to throw that all away uh, because, you know, it didn't really improve. So it's, the optics there uh, are not very good. Now, I'm not telling you that actually we have answers to all this. This is really almost, I would say, a research problem, uh, which I basically, you know, in some way, I think it's interesting for you to, to hear it. We have a few solutions that we're, exp uh, that we're going after, which allow us to make progress. The first one, and that's why actually people are so excited about deep learning, is that we are trying to design systems that are domain independent, that have this, what's called these, you know, 
artificial general intelligence that, don't, that could work in kind of every domain. That's kind of the holy grail there. So when you train it, you feel you train it for all the domain at the same time, and you can do it once, and it will work everywhere. We're still far from that, but there are progress, and these deep learning techniques uh, give us some hope. Kind of the next frontier that many companies believe is to apply these deep learning techniques that are working very well for speech and vision, apply to natural language. The second is to be really, really uh, good about collecting and having data. Do whatever it takes to collect the data to be able to test the system. And sometimes you can do some weird stuff. So one problem we have with Watson is, if Watson doesn't have data to train itself, well, you can't put it in front of the customer uh, because you know, it's not good enough yet. But if you don't put it in front of the customer, you cannot connect real data. So some ideas we have is to actually have mechanical Turks behind Watson to pretend to be Watson and collect the question that people actually ask. This way we can get this question. And in the grand scheme of things, that may be the right way to do it. So getting that data, you need to have data because you need to be able to test and experiment. That's the key of this. And then you, create, you need to provide great tools for this because actually these tests are often better done by not, people who are not software engineers, more by domain experts. They know what the answers are for the, the, the question, and they're the better one to enter this thing there. And I think the last piece, which you know, hasn't been done before, is to hire people like you. That means this system was developed by researchers, and they were kind of experts in it. They were not experts in software engineering. And I believe that actually we need to have kind of a new level of software engineering adapted to kind of these cognitive processes. And that leads me to my shameless plug, uh, which is that, hey, my team is hiring. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, Watson is, is, is the new face of IBM. And I'll tell you one thing. The reason to, uh, to come to Watson is not because now it has a new headquarter in Manhattan, it tries to have a startup culture, and it's also trying to hire the best and brightest, is that we are attacking a set of problems that I think that nobody is, is doing. I mean, the, I show you, you know, medical problems. I, I read an article on Hackers News yesterday, and this, this little, if you can read it, uh, made me, uh, made me or smile in some way or, or cry. But really, we are trying to tackle the world most interesting problem out there. And the world problem that as of today, you know, Africa's problems, we're trying to have, uh, solve medical problems, trying to solve support problems, government problems. And I think these are the most interesting problems. And I think there are other problems that are less interesting. And I'll let you judge. <laughs> Yeah? So I've thought a lot about uh, problems where there's no right answer. Um, I'm curious what kinds of tools, if you could say more about the kinds of tools you, uh, the, the groups that you've been working on to help people understand what the system is doing in, the, in these kind of problems where it's hard to know if, what the right answer is. Now, I, I, it's a very good question. So at the end, right now, in most of the problem we, we try to solve, we try to have some kind of an, we try to have some kind of answer to train the system. So as good as it is, we will actually try to come up with some answers. And sometimes what I'm trying to introduce more and more is the idea of a, a not so accurate answer. So you have a system where you're going to say, OK, it was 70% 70, 70 accurate. And there are ways to do that, because you can look at, it's often about text there. So when you look at your answer, and you have another provided answer, you look at the similarity between the, team, between the two, the overlap, the conceptual similarity between the two. So trying to create these fuzzy matching tools to evaluate that. Um, I know you come from the search world and I come from there. It was also very difficult to figure out you know, what's the best answer in this case. Actually, in some cases, Watson, because we are trying to give the actual answer rather than the page, may have a better notion of an answer. But we, right now, our idea is we try to approximate as much as possible uh, a best answer to kind of train and guide the system. I read that you were trying to get Watson to pass the medical boards. I was wondering how you're doing against that goal. That's right. So actually, the team that developed uh, Jeopardy uh, is applying that now to the US, US MLE, OK? So it's the medical uh, board exam. I believe right now, so the way it works, there are multiple classes of questions. The one that's the best is, uh, is diagnostic. So they get a case, and then they have actually five possible answers. And I think Watson right now, we are at something like 59% accuracy for this. 
to pass the exam, you have to be at 65, something like this. I'm banging my team every day to say, when are we going to make an announcement that we can actually you know, pass the exam or do it publicly? So I'm having this discussion with them, but we're, we're getting close. Yeah. So, so at what point will Watson start asking us questions? Well, actually, that's a very good question. We're actually working on it. I have actually a team right now working on that. We call that dialogue. So the key is that when you ask questions, we try to get clarification from you about the context. So actually, we are, there's actually a deployment that's going to go to a customer where we start doing that. It's very hard. Dialogue is even harder than just answering questions. Um, so you know, it's the start of it. I've heard that one of the challenges with Watson is the, uh, the problems with customization for each project that you work on. Can you speak about that? That's right. That's exactly one of the problems I mentioned is domain adaptation. Okay? And there are different types of domain adaptation. Okay? One is because the language is different. So when you go in the medical domain, the terms mean different things. You know, the synonyms are not the same, etc. That's something that I think we're getting a, a, a grasp on. You know, we can adapt it to this. What we found is even harder is when you go in different uh, fields, well, imagine questions, right? Questions can have many kind of answers. And then you start finding different types of questions that require different types of processing. So the latest one we did is in the financial world, where you had a financial advisor asking, what's the outlook for gold? Okay. Well, that answer doesn't have normally the way Watson works is we find an answer in the text somewhere. But here, you have to compute it based on sentiment all these things. So now we are here. We are creating a sentiment analysis tool that's going to go try to analyze, you know, the outlook based on the way people talk about gold in multiple documents. But it's an, a completely new way of processing it. So we are back into what I mentioned earlier: it's adding these new heuristics for every new customer. What we are hoping is we'll find enough redundancy across the domain that we don't have to do that too often. But it's one of the big challenge. There's new types of questions that require new type of processing to be answered. One of the mechanisms that our brains has in dealing with, with, me, with information is forgetting or long-term memory. Um, that's how it keeps relevant information in the small size of the brain. Is that reflected at all in, in Watson? Because it seems like you're going to need an infrastructure to run it. It will grow with the growth of the information. So. That's actually a very good question. And I, I never thought about it as a, as a parallel with the brain. But we have uh, a big issue around Okay, what is the uh, importance data based on the date it was produced? Okay, and there are big problems because some some information is still valid, you know, reference information, and some information is not. And what's the weight for that? So that's something we're taking co into consideration. We're actually working on it right now. Uh, I never actually thought about it as a parallel with the brain, but it's a good good analogy because it's somewhere also in the brain it fades away, it doesn't disappear directly, and it's kind of the same thing there it's to weigh the answer based on uh, how uh, how recent they are. So another recent announcement, I believe, was that Watson can debate with uh, people. Um, I was wondering if you could give us an update on that. And then secondly, are you looking to add any more human characteristics to it, like humor? Man, there must be like, you know, announcement every day about Watson can do this and can do that that I don't know about. No, I'm, I'm okay. Actually, I know about this one. So there's a project. It's also a grand challenge in IBM called Debater. And the goal for that, it's actually built on top of uh, some of the Watson component is for uh, Watson to be able to uh, uh, argue something. So you give, it a, you give it a case and you say, okay, argue this way, you know, for this penalty or against this penalty. And then it reads all the information, you know, Wikipedia and stuff like that, finds argument and build the argument for you and, and, and debate on it. That's, that's the idea. So that's the grand challenge. There is actually a, a TV show, I think, in, in, uh, in the UK where people have to do that and the idea will be to compete. And then you ask about so yes, actually, when we're looking at conversation, we're trying to, uh, and we'll make some announcement pretty soon about that, we're, we're trying to have a personality in the conversation. Uh, we have also ways of kind of analyzing personality. I mean, I don't know uh, how advanced that is. You know, uh, I think it's, it's kind of an infancy. But there is an aspect, when you interact with an avatar like this, you want somebody that has a little bit of, I mean, you know, like Siri actually has it, I think, and, and, and all these uh, agents try to be a little humoristic there. So I think it's, it's a part of that. 
We're not very good at IBM with humor, but we are getting there. <laughs> Any other questions? 